So um, today, this webinar is going to be hosted by Rebecca Hughes, who is um, a part of our um, other healthcare team. And she has been practicing for 17 years as a practitioner. And we're also going to be joined by Shah Harvey, who is um, a health coach from our other healthcare team as well. So I'm going to kick us off with a question that someone has sent in through the week. Um, so Rebecca, this one's going to be straight over to you. So the question is, um, I'm immune compromised. What can I do to protect myself um, during this time? Well, immune compromise, I suppose, can mean a few things. So I don't know um, exactly what that person's dealing with, but usually what it means is that there's some kind of diminished immune response. And it might be due to um, medications that someone's on or a condition that they have, or even pregnant women are considered to be a little bit immune compromised as well. So, you know, Jade talked last week about the things that you can do for immune function, which are to fuel the immune system with the things that it needs, to um, stimulate the immune system, to borrow immunity or to be directly sidle or killing of, of what, you know, what you're dealing with. So I would say for people who are immune compromised that they really need to make sure that they do have the fuel that they need to make um, to, to generate an immune response. So that might be through, so dietary factors might be adequate protein, for example, because your immune system actually needs protein to generate all of the, the white blood cells and all of the entire you know, inflammatory response that it launches against particular bacteria and viruses. But it also needs really essential nutrients like vitamin C, zinc and D. <clears throat> so that's part of fuel, fueling your immune system. And then you can borrow immunity from substances like lactoferrin and colostrum and to, to a degree even some probiotic strains. And you can stimulate it. I, I think being immune compromised, it would depend on the degree of how immune compromised someone is because stimulating someone in a depleted state can be um, uh, not harmful, but might overstimulate their entire system. But there are certain, uh, I suppose, herbs that are known to stimulate an immune response, such as echinacea and astragalus. Um, uh, some adaptogenic herbs like ginsengs can can stimulate the immune system a little bit. But like I said, it's not something we use if someone's really, really depleted. And then there are uh, substances that will directly kill a bacteria or a virus. So I'd say that's the thing that people need who are immune compromised need to focus on. But also the main thing I would say at this time, because it's quite stressful, you know, this the whole situation that stress is, chronic stress is a known um, factor for depleting the immune response. So I think that's a really, really important factor to manage, particularly when people are going to be in Victoria and in other areas going to be self-isolating now quite strictly for the next four weeks. Wonderful. And I might throw over to Shah. Um, so we hear quite often a lot around, um, you know, don't stress too much and de-stress, but how can people actually implement that and, and, work on their on their stress yes yeah, so i'm actually really grateful that we live in a time where we can be isolated but we can actually still connect um, there's heaps and heaps of tools that we can um, utilize to be able to manage that stress so by nourishing your body nourishing your brain you're going to be supporting your immune system so there are there's, there's kind of practical ways. You don't have to do it in front of a screen, but there's certainly plenty of practical apps that you can use as well, which I kind of like because we seem to be glued to our screens at the moment, being overwhelmed by media and, and all the negativity that's going on at the moment. So uh, as far as apps go, for de-stress and mindfulness, I think it's really important um, you know, we recommend people do a breathing and things like that. So four, seven, eight breathing technique uh, where you breathe in for four, hold for seven and breathe out for eight. Um, but there's also apps that can help you with that as well. So if you want to teach yourself, so there's really practical tools. So apps such as Calm, you can download that one. These are all totally free as well. Insight Timer, uh, there's actually an app called Breathing App. Uh, so that can help us kind of, you know, get connected with ourselves in a really stressful time. 
uh, access the parasympathetic nervous system, which I'm sure Rebecca can probably speak to a little bit more. Wonderful. So really good strategy. So I think, yeah, going for an app is a really good idea. Um, as you said, 478, that's a breathing technique that we recommend um, quite a lot. Um, as well as Insight Timer, I've had great success with that. And Calm is a really another popular one with, um, with our patients. Rebecca, do you want to speak a little bit more to the, as Shah was saying, how those things can really help with our nervous system at this time? Yeah, sure. So um, Shah mentioned the parasympathetic nervous system, and that is a branch of our autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is just required for all those things that you don't have to think about, like breathing and your heart beating and your digestion doing what it does. But that whole, all of those organs and systems are, um, they're innovated by the autonomic nervous system and there are two branches. One is parasympathetic, which is associated with resting, digesting, restoring, repairing and the sympathetic nervous system, which is generally associated more with fight, flight, freeze. So you can see how during this time that the fight, flight, freeze response is likely to be really dominant, depending on, you know, people are stressed by a number of things at the moment, by um, infection itself, there's the fear of infection, um, economic pressures, because it's quite crazy at the moment what's happening with, um, with people's incomes and businesses. And then also now the, I suppose, the additional social stress or of self-isolation and being having really limited contact with other humans. So um, I think it really is important to keep reminding our bodies and keep sending its signals of what it is to be in that parasympathetic nervous system state. And, and sometimes you do need to physically remind it. So breathing is certainly one of those things of, even if it isn't the four, seven, eight pattern, doing whatever breathing technique that you know how to do um, that's going to send a physical signal to your brain that you're in a relaxed state. And that's ultimately what it is. You need to physically remind your brain of, of what it needs to do. Um, I think there are other strategies that are really useful for um, reminding us of the parasympathetic nervous system state. There's certainly plenty of evidence to show that being in nature and spending adequate time in nature is really good for your sense of well-being and relaxation. Uh, there's also um, physical activity, like not necessarily the most vigorous, like high intensity physical activity, but having regular physical activity is something that can get you into that parasympathetic nervous system state. And interestingly, also at this time, which I think is perfect, is there's so much evidence to show that doing good and charitable work is really great for calming the nervous system. And, you know, because essentially it's getting your attention and focus off yourself and onto someone else. And so there are a lot of opportunities right now as well. I noticed that I'm in some community Facebook groups where people are self-isolating. They might be health professionals, they might be elderly, but they really do need assistance. So I would, I would urge people to really looking in their community about how they can go and make a difference in their community at this time as well. Um, great one. That's a really good tip. Um, so just got a question that's popped through. So personal interactions are really important for health. So is there a mindset tip about how to keep safe distance, but still getting the benefits of, of human connection. So I might go to Rebecca first and see what, um, what your response is to this and then um, jump over to Shah and see as a health coach um, if she's got any tips or strategies as well. Did you say a mindset, Courtney? Yeah, so is there a mindset tip about how to keep safe distance but still getting the benefits of human connection? Yeah, well, yeah, as I said, I think it really, really is critical that we, that we keep human connection alive at this time and of course with the physical distancing and you know in Victoria they've just um, introduced oh it's not just Victoria it's nationwide isn't it that it's stage three so there's only groups of two people at a time that are allowed to be in one place so I think you know there are ways that you could do physical activity for example with other people and still maintain appropriate social distancing and and I think now we're going to be relying more and more on technology and I think I, I think Shah is a good person to talk about the, all the technological um, tools that are now available. For, I mean, I haven't learned about them this week. Like, I didn't know that you could watch TV with other people. So um, I think Shah can really speak to that. 
Yeah, really, uh, really, really good point. Really well said. Um, these are the things that I'm doing at the moment and people in my household are doing at the moment to stay connected with those around them. Um, I have two teenagers at home and they are doing um, hosting Netflix parties. Um, that's an add-on for um, your yeah, internet browser so you can watch movies with friends and you know chat about it and it's all live and all at the same time. Um, there's also <clears throat> Google Hangout um, and an app called House Party that um, young people are actually jumping on, but I've been watching them and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a really amazing tool to keep us all connected. Um, you can play games online with people. Um, and of course you've got Zoom. Um, everybody that's on here uses Zoom at the moment. Um, Zoom lunches, Zoom brunches. A lot of people are at, you know, at home at the moment. So they've got the time to be able to um, set these things up and explore the technology around, around all of this stuff. I was talking to B yesterday and she said she'd had a dance party in her kitchen. Um, she'd done an exercise program online. Uh, and these are all things that I think as humans, we crave that interaction. It's just how we are. Um, and, and we need to kind of nurture that so that we don't feel too isolated. Yeah, I definitely agree. I um, hosted a Zoom platter chatter party on Friday night with my closest friends and we're doing that um, weekly. It's my birthday in a couple of weeks, so I've had to move my party onto Zoom. But I think for those that maybe aren't tech savvy or don't have access to that, some really simple ways as well to connect is just, it sounds so simple, but just when you're passing someone, if you are out doing the groceries or maybe you are going for a walk, giving a smile to people, saying good morning, saying hello, I did my groceries a couple of weeks ago um, when everything first started to happen and I was like loving the supermarket, it was very quiet, it was very chill and I was just smiling at people as I walked past and a lot of people did a double take because they didn't expect it. So I think you don't always have to have physical contact or have big conversations to be getting your human connection and interactions. A simple smile, a simple good morning, maybe even just waving at someone while you're waiting at the traffic lights as well. So get creative and I think um, a lot of people People are also looking for it too so if you lead um, some sort of interaction like that a lot of people are going to reciprocate as well going to move on to, uh, to another question again coming back to autoimmunity that's just come through so someone's just said I have an autoimmune condition am I at greater risk of getting really sick with the COVID-19 virus shall I stop playing with the controls <laughs> Oh, I can't hear. Can you hear me, Courtney? Sorry, I can't hear you. Yep. So if you just um, answer that question, do you want me to repeat it? Yeah. No, no, that's okay. I've got it now. Um, I think people with um, autoimmune diseases, so if, if you don't know what an autoimmune condition is, it's where the immune system becomes a little hyper-stimulated and, and a little bit uh, aberrant, I suppose, in that it starts to recognise the human body's own tissue as something that's threatening. And that can show up in many different parts of the body, unfortunately. So, for example, with rheumatoid arthritis, it affects the synovial capsule around the joint. Um, it can affect people's gut in terms of uh, chronic Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It shows up as lupus, Hashimoto's thyroid disease. There, there are a bunch of different presentations. And depending on the severity, I suppose, of the autoimmune condition, these people may or may not be on uh, immune suppressing medications. Some people are, some people are not. Um, but I would say if you are on an immune suppressing medication that potentially you are at a slightly greater risk than other members in society because those medications are designed to control the inflammation in your body and part of that can involve suppressing that immune response. So I would say for those people that it's really important as I spoke to before about um, fueling the immune system with the, with the with the building blocks that it needs so that when there's an actual threat of a virus or a bacteria, that it can respond appropriately to that threat. And I would also say that also going, I know I keep talking about it, but stress is a really, really big trigger also for people with autoimmune conditions. In fact, it's probably one of the, the primary 
exacerbating factors. And so for people with autoimmune conditions, I think now it's particularly important to be on top of managing that as a trigger. And, and I guess that's easy to say, but in terms of some of the, the strategies that we've spoken about today in staying connected with people, staying connected with nature and using mindfulness practices will be really, really valuable skills for, for you to cultivate at this time. And um, just as a little segue, not necessarily related to people with autoimmune conditions, but I think also at this time, I noticed that, you know, when humans are stressed, they generally want to soothe, soothe themselves, like make themselves feel better. And what we tend to go to are those things, you know, the things that make us personally feel better. And that will be different for every single person. But um, usually what I find some of the typical coping strategies, because I've seen it over years in practice, is... Um, eating more than usual or eating foods that usually that perhaps you shouldn't be eating too much of so comforting foods that contain a lot of sugar or a lot of fat uh, alcohol um, can be a really common thing used for self-soothing and if you have had i suppose issues with substances or do have issues with substances now could now might be a time when it might be more compelling to go back to old habits um, and maybe, you know, watching lots of TV and things like that. So, and, and I guess now that we're, going, we're asked, to being spend, asked to spend more time indoors and, more time, and less time with other people, that it could be easy to move to these old habits and vices to self-soothe. And I think that's why it's really important to cultivate these other strategies so that, you know, we're less inclined to, to use those other to use those other less helpful or less healthy strategies to cope. Yeah, for sure. Shah, do you just want to speak to um, yeah that idea of people falling back into their their bad habits um, coping mechanism, and particularly around like um, eating? I know a lot of people are eating because they're bored, they're emotional eating. So how can they maintain that healthy eating to look after their immune system as well as just generally looking out for their their vices? Yeah, so this is where mindfulness and mindset really come into play. Um, <clears throat> when we're really stressed, it's uh, usual for us to want to comfort ourselves, just like Rebecca was saying. Um, and mindfulness and mindset can actually help us be in the present moment a little bit more. So noticing those feelings of why am I eating a block of chocolate right now? Why do I want to eat an entire bag of chips? Um, you know, bringing us to the moment will make us recognise that we're doing these things. So there's a couple of things that you can do to help that. Um, one of my favourites, uh, and this is kind of everywhere at the moment, is uh, journaling. So you can have something as simple as a piece of paper and a pen to be able to do that. Um, and gratitude journaling is something that can be really, really helpful for people to um, get into a mindset that's not up here. Um, it can kind of bring us down and aware of our surroundings, um, particularly with all of the negative media and stuff around at the moment. So what that looks like is, well, what it could look like is uh, just writing down three things when you wake up in the morning that you're grateful for. Um, and then you look at your brain that you want to see yourself um, there are a couple of apps that can help you with that as well. So if you need help or if you need prompts, um, some of these apps will actually message you. You can set a time and, and go, right, okay, these, these things can help hold you accountable um, if you don't have a health coach. So uh, these apps are called Gratitude um, is a really good one. And I've just stumbled across a new one called Happier. And it's kind of like a social media um, it's like Facebook for happy people, I think. Um, and I'm just exploring that at the moment. So I'd be really interested to know um, if anybody downloads that and, and what they think about it. Uh, it's also nurturing that connection with other people as well at the same time, um, whilst kind of, you know, keeping us focused and, and thinking about the good things in life. Awesome. For those that are maybe um, taking this opportunity to be do a bit of a digital detox and don't want to go for an app, um, what would you um, give like as three prompts to maybe for journaling or for gratitude? 
Yeah, so it's really helpful when you're doing any like any kind of change to anchor that change with something that you do really regularly. So for breathing, for instance, um, we like to tell people to do that when they go to the toilet. So um, if you come in clinic, you'll see on the back of the toilet door, the 478 breathing technique. And for me, since I've been working at the clinic, it means that whenever I go to the toilet, wherever I am, that is just something that I do. Um, so it's turned into a habit that I don't really have to think about anymore. I think we've been afforded a bit of an opportunity here with all of this working from home stuff. Um, it's taken a lot of travel out of our day, so we can't use the excuse of not having the time to actually do it anymore. We can, we can kind of go, okay, well, maybe I'll give this a go and actually see how it fits in um, with my life. Uh, you could do that with gratitude um, with your sleep. So if you wanted to bookend your day, so everybody's sleeping, everybody's waking up, everybody's going to bed. And if you can wake up and do some journaling, um, that would be great. When you're going to bed, you can be doing the same thing. Um, also around eating time. So if you're eating with your family, sharing the gratitude with, the fam with your family as well um, is going to help everybody stay a little bit happier when they're cooped up together. Fantastic. And for those that um, want um, some, some prompts or a little bit more information on, on journaling in particular, we do have an Instagram post as well as a Facebook post um, explaining it. If it's a new concept for you or something that you want to get back into, um, there's definitely those resources on our Facebook and on our Instagram. I'm going to start to wrap up the webinar with two questions. So the first one, is from Dorothy and she would like to know if I was to get COVID-19 with a sore throat and all those other symptoms but don't need to go to hospital what would you suggest to help me cope with those symptoms? Um, I, I suppose that that question has two aspects to it because I think if you believe that you have COVID-19 symptoms and you fit the criteria you probably should it's what's responsible is to go and get tested um, and I suppose ultimately the, the doctors and nurses at the hospital will triage your situation and determine whether you need testing. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also, and it's, it's well known that actually there's been another fairly significant virus circulating around Victoria, I know at the time, and um, a lot of people have presented to, to get tested and haven't had it, but have had a lot of other respiratory symptoms. So that's, I suppose, going back to managing the immune system and in terms of direct um, at-home remedies, certainly garlic is known to be a potent antiviral. And given that we're spending less time with other humans at the moment, you can consume as much garlic as you like, possibly without offending lots of other people. Um, and uh, there's, if you're growing herbs in your garden, I could suggest things like um, Thyme as a herb, you can also get it from the supermarket, uh, has some antibacterial and antiviral qualities. It's also particularly good for chesty coughs. Um, ginger, especially if it's raw and you can grate it and then simmer it in some hot water, that's fantastic for warming and um, has some, anti, some potent anti-inflammatory action. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things that can be used from around the house in terms of Garlic, thyme, uh, sage, ginger, and then making sure that you're having foods that are really rich in vitamin C, such as um, berries, kiwi fruit, capsicum, parsley is, in, is intensely rich in vitamin C and iron. Um, yeah, that, that would be the, the sort of home remedies that I'd be looking at. And given that there's been some beautiful days of sunshine recently, even getting out on your own and lying in the park in the sun, I think, and soaking up the rays would be a really good thing to do as well. And just on that with all the herbs and so really great suggestions, how are we consuming them? Are we making a tea? Are we making a broth? Are we cooking with them? How can we get them into our bodies? Uh, okay, so definitely making um, teas and decoctions. So what you could do is you could simmer the, grate some ginger root, and simmer it in hot water for about 10 minutes. And then you could use, and then add in the fresh thyme, fresh or dried. If you, if you only have access to dried, you can use that too. Sage is also really good for sore throats. So those two herbs are quite antiseptic and antimicrobial. Throw those into the in with the hot water as well. 
make sure all of it's covered because when you leave it covered, the volatile constituents in those herbs can't escape. And it's often the actual the volatile compounds in the oils of those plants that it has the medicinal value. And then, and what I would recommend is actually making up a great big batch for yourself and then having about three to six cups a day of that is, is a therapeutic amount. And garlic, you can, I would have suggest having garlic and you can, and, and it needs to be freshly crushed. Cooked garlic doesn't have the same amount of the active ingredient called allicin. So you need to have fresh garlic and so you could use that, you could use that in cooking or food, but just make sure you add it as the last ingredient that you crush it and add it into the food and have that two or three times a day as well. Wonderful. I hope that answers your question there, Dorothy. Lots of little um, teas and broths and um, the way you can use all those um, ingredients. So our last question we're going to finish up on for today, and it's a very practical question, and I think everyone will probably be able to relate to this. Um, but we had a question come through. My hands are really dry from washing them all the time and using sanitizers. What can I do for my dry hands? Well, yeah, look, I think it's really important because I noticed that, um, and this will be happening also for people who are working in situations that, for their jobs where they need to wash their hands frequently, probably more frequently than others. And when you're washing your hands all the time, it doesn't matter, really matter what it's with, whether it's with soap, detergent, those, both of those substances contain molecules that is there. The whole idea of, hand washing is that it's the physical and mechanical activity of combining the soap with the detergent and the water with whatever is on your skin. And the molecules that are in there attach to whatever is on your skin and remove it, whether that be bacteria, dirt, oils, food, whatever it is. Which is why um, with, with hand washing to prevent coronavirus, they're saying that the activity has to be vigorous and lengthy to actually remove anything that's on your hands. Of course, the upshot of that is that then you're removing all of those protective oils that exist on the surface of your skin, which actually are the protective barrier on your skin, not just on your hands, but everywhere. The oils that we produce in our body actually are part of our, what's called our barrier function. And they, they protect things from going into our body through our skin. So I think it's important that Definitely to keep hand washing because it's one of the primary um, measures that we have for limiting transmission of coronavirus. But we also need to couple that with putting a protective barrier back on our skin. So regular, if you've got hand lotion or hand cream, regular moisturising after you've been hand washing. So you'll be doing a lot of hand washing and a lot of hand moisturising. And if you want to do something that's even more, I suppose, protective you could directly put oils on your skin so you can use things like olive oil or coconut oil and uh, or any kind of fat you could put that on your skin i know for people on your hands that might not be an attractive thing to do though because you're touching yourself and touching all these other surfaces so that might not be the most practical way to do it but if you actually are finding that your eczema or dermatitis is being aggravated during this time with all the extra hand washing, you might need to take extra measures of using something that actually is fat-based to protect your skin. Wonderful, great. I'm definitely, um, will be making a hand oil, I think, when I get home today. So we're gonna leave today's webinar there. Thank you everyone for coming and joining and, and asking all your questions and also sending through questions earlier today, uh, this week as well. That was wonderful. So um, make sure that you're signed up. We'll be doing this again next week, next Wednesday. Um, so again, feel free to send through any questions that you want to. Make sure that you are signed up to get the notifications via email um, of the webinar. Um, for further support, obviously our current patients, please reach out to your health coaches or book in to see your practitioner. If you're not a current patient, so we usually only take on and work with new people in our six month program, but due to what's going on in the world, we have opened up our one-off immune health SOS session. So um, for those of you on Zoom, you'll be sent a link in an email um, later today. And for those of you on Facebook, the link will be popped down in the comments below. Um, all these sessions are happening via telehealth. So that either means um, like a Zoom consult like now or a phone call. 
Um, and make sure that you are following us on our social media. So our Instagram is at Melbourne Functional Medicine, uh, sorry, Melbourne FX Med, and our Facebook is Melbourne Functional Medicine too. So we're posting, um, like we were talking today about different tips and strategies, we've been posting those things quite regularly and have a few more things um, coming. We've got a, a workout by our health coach B um, to get you off the couch and get you moving and the blood flowing. Um, but in the meantime, take care of yourself, make sure you're um, maintaining all those social distancing um, um, isolating in a really good way not you don't have to be isolated in isolation make sure that you're reaching out to those people around you and reaching out to your support network as well and make sure that you're hitting all your four pillars daily so eating moving sleeping and de-stressing thank you guys for joining us again and we hope to see you all next week bye